Well, good morning, Eagle Church. Would you stand up with us as we prepare to worship together? It's good to be with you. First Peter chapter 2 talks about how we are a chosen people, and it says that God chose us in order that we may proclaim His excellencies or declare His praises, as another translation says. So that's what we're here to do this morning. We're here to praise God, to worship Him together, to hear from His Word, and to hopefully be transformed in our lives to go out and to proclaim His name to the world around us. Let's pray together, and we're going to sing, Father, we love you. It's good to be here, gathered with your people, in order to bring you praise, to proclaim your name, to declare that you're worthy, that you are good, that you are sovereign, and that you are Lord. And so we want to do that this morning, Lord. You should be honored with our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
You guys can have a seat. I just want to say welcome to Eagle Church. My name is Justin. I'm the worship and missions pastor here. And uh, if you're new here, if you're a guest, I want to say welcome. And uh, if you want to find out more about who we are, uh, you can stop by uh, the info table on the way out. You can check out our website and that kind of thing. But I'll just say from the outset, we put our best energy in three areas. If you've been around here for a long time, you've heard this a million times, hopefully. Um, discipleship, which is just becoming like Jesus, following Jesus. Uh, missions, and next generation. And we've been doing these things that we call missions moments where we feature one of our strategic missions partners. And if you're part of the Safe Families group, you guys should know who you are. You guys can make your way up. Um, We're going to highlight one of our strategic partners called Safe Families for Children. And um, to do that, we're going to have a group of people come up who are involved in this ministry. And the thing I love about this group is it's just kind of an organic growing group. And it's a bunch of people who live busy lives like you and I do, who are sacrificially opening their homes and showing biblical hospitality to care for kids. And so um, to kind of facilitate this space, uh, this is Bryce. Everybody say hi, Bryce. And his wife, Jana. And they kind of are leading this team. And so I just asked them to kind of harvest out some stories and talk about what God's doing through this community. So would you guys give this group a hand and, and welcome to the stage. Yeah, this is, uh, this is exciting for us. Probably about a, two years ago, maybe, there was maybe three or four families that would have been standing up here, so this is pretty fun to, uh, to see. I guess y'all can stand back there. Um, yeah, so we have more than 15 families now that are involved with three different areas, actually. Safe families is kind of what we're highlighting, but we have families who are in foster care, who are adoptive parents, and some that do all three. So uh, just as a show of hands, who is uh, Safe Families? few families. Who is foster care or foster care and adoption? So yeah, there's a little bit of everything going on up here, um, which is super exciting for us. So first, there's a, there's a few of them that I've prepped with some questions, so this is not just random, but they don't know who, when they're getting picked, though. Um, so first of all, with the busyness of life and work and the craziness, I'm going to start with Joy. And the craziness of schedules, I know you guys have kids in sports and piano lessons. Both of you work. Kyle travels a lot. What helped you decide to jump in and get involved with Safe Families? Um, You're exactly right. I have three kids who are busy in lots of different things. And um, I decided to do Safe Families because I have an extra bed and an extra, um, lots of extra food because my kids hate what I make every meal. (laughs) Uh, my safe family's kiddo loved it. I said I needed to put him on video to um, make a little infomercial for my food. Um, but I had extra food, I have an extra bed, and I have extra space in our house for somebody. And I don't have time, honestly. I love the City Life Ministry, and I really, really wish I could do that. And my heart is for that. And every time they come up, I'm like, stop talking. You're just pulling at my heartstrings. But I just don't have time, and I don't have this space. But I have space in my house for someone to join me in what my family is already doing. So that is some, one of the reasons why I chose to do Safe Families. Yeah, that's great. A lot of us in this room have space. Uh, Kevin and Tiffany, would you guys mind answering what, what made you guys decide to jump into foster care and then adoption? Um, well, basically, it started with my wife as a physician, and she got to work with some foster kids uh, in her practice. And so kind of felt that we could do more. Uh, we could help out by uh, bringing them into our house. And we have, as she said, we've got space. We have the, 
the means to be able to do that, and so that's how it kind of started. So we started initially with foster, and then we did something called respite care. So when you foster other people's kids, sometimes you need a break. And so when you need that break, you have someone else that you can sub-foster a child to called respite care. And so with respite care, uh, we got to meet other families that way, and then we worked our way into pre-adoption. Um, we finally adopted one child, and then while we were still fostering, um, we had an emergency placement, and we ended up adopting a second child. That's, that's great. Joe and Allison, would you mind answering the same question? Um, what made you guys decide to get involved? Brent and Mandy, I'm coming to you next. Um, I think for my part, we just really felt the call of children that needed something um, on our hearts, and so we talked about it. Um, like Joy said, we've got three children, too. They're all in school. They're all in sports. So we kind of went our separate ways, prayed for a couple weeks, and then came back together, and we both said, um, yeah, I think we need to do this. So um, like I typically do a little more than Joe, we just kind of jumped in. and um, it, That's not true. <laughs> it was actually my idea. <laughs> So um, I think I meant like we just jumped in not really knowing how it was going to work. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a mixed bag. It's been wonderful for our family. There's been times we've had to talk and say what worked, what didn't work. How do we make your needs met? How do we help um, the children that we're bringing into our home? And um, I think it's just been a wonderful experience. It's opened our eyes to the need um, that is just constant uh, every day, and we can't always meet it, but do what we can. I think we also wanted to teach our children the, the giving spirit. I mean, they have everything, and it's it's our fault that they do. And uh, you know, all the bickering and fighting, and they have a two-parent home, and we just wanted to show them that you know, bringing in another child, that this child might not have everything that you have, and you need to, you need to give, you need to show love, and I think that's helped a lot for our family. That's great. Brent and Mandy, what, what made you guys decide to jump into infant adoption? So we chose uh, to start our family through infant domestic adoption, and um, when we started talking about starting a family, it just felt like we reflected back on our lives, and there had been a lot of seeds planted in both our lives since we were very young kids um, for adoption, just people we knew and just different experiences. And we prayed a lot about it, and we decided that that was our calling to start a family. Um, it was plan A through adoption. So. That's great. All right, next question, Kevin and Tiffany. Um, well, I forgot it. How, how have your children or... Your one biological child, how's he responded to having other kids um, into your well, home? Our son was an only child for more than 11 years, and he was excited about the idea of siblings. And I'd say that adding a child to our family was still really a challenge because becoming an only child, or starting from an only child and then adding someone, it's really a huge adjustment. And then adding a second one, which wasn't completely planned, but was a great thing he's learned a lot and he's acclimated well and I think we all have there's always challenges but there's also many rewards and it's just like any other family um, so it's been a, a great experience do you want to add great. anything to that Warren? <laughs> Warren do you want to add anything? Thumbs up. <laughs> Joy would you answer that question how's it been uh, for your children having other children in their space? Um. I would say anytime you add someone to your family, it disrupts your normal flow, as we find out during the holidays. Even if we love our family members, sometimes they get annoying, even, <laughs> even if you're related to them. So adding someone to your household does change things up, but it provides a good perspective. Um, one of my boys um, said something. He's like, I don't want to say this, but he's kind of annoying. And I said, you're kind of annoying, too. <laughs> but um, it was like, <laughs> like, if you lived with someone else, you would be. But it was a good just realization that, but we need to show love to them regardless. I go, God asks us to love everyone. And yes, it's easier to love your friends at school and the people you like. But when someone is living with you and um, is the same age as you and you guys are all competing on video games and competing in sports together, there's sometimes that there's friction and sometimes you just need to show love. And God asks us to love everyone. And I said, by doing this, you're actually being a missionary in your own home. 
And they thought that was kind of crazy. They're like, I'm a missionary? And I said, you are a missionary. We're showing Jesus' love to people who might not see it in other places. So you get to be the opportunity to be a missionary that is also a kid. And they thought that that was really neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Great opportunity in regard to teaching your children about what it looks like to be engaged with kingdom work. Uh, Brent and Mandy, what would you guys say uh, God has shown you or taught you as a result of having adopted? So first of all, we've gained a lot of new friends, many of which are on this stage. Um, We didn't know a lot of people when we first started coming here, but um, this group really gave us new friends, so that's been awesome. Um, And also, we feel like our God has really strengthened our faith. Um, We feel like we stepped out in faith when we decided to do this to start our family, a lot of unknowns. Um, And we went through a failed adoption, and that really tested us um, and strengthened our faith and our trust in God and our reliance on Him. And ultimately, almost immediately, that led us to our sweet baby Monroe here. So, you know, we can't imagine life without him now. So, That's great. He's pretty cool. All right, last question. We're going to wrap it up. What would you guys say to anybody out here who's feeling prompting or tug of the Spirit to get involved with either safe families or foster care or adoption? We're all three. Um, yeah, so let's start with Kevin and Tiffany. What would you, what would you tell our friends here? Um, I, I guess the first and foremost thing is, is if you have the time and you have the means to be able to do something like this, it's wonderful. Um, it, it's a wonderful addition. It's, as other people have said on the stage here, it's the ability to, you know, give back. It's the ability to give more um, than what you've been given from others and to be able to pass on a lot of things um, that you want to pass on with thoughts, with ideals, um, and things to other kids. Um, but if you're trying to do it as a patch, uh, as a, a fix to a family or something like that, think again. Um, because you're going to have, as you have with any kids, um, a lot of stress, but also you'll have a lot of joys. You'll have a lot of pleasures and to bring a new experience. Um, and it's wonderful, and it's a wonderful feeling. I think all of us up here feel the same way, is that if you had to do it all over again, you wouldn't change a thing. Um, because you're able to, to give back and to, um, to add and to give a path to where some of these kids would never have. They would never be able to be into some of the ministries that they're going to work their way to um, and some of the things that they can do, uh, you know, good. Yeah, that's good. Brent and Mandy, what would you say to anybody thinking about getting involved? So we would say if you feel the call, start praying, pray and pray and pray, um, and then seek the advice of other people who've been through this journey. Um, that's what helped us a lot, just leaning into people on this stage and asking them to pray for us. Um, and we want to be that for other people. So, you know, we're happy to talk to people if they are interested in specifically domestic infant adoption. Um, we feel like that's part of our calling is to help other people too. And um, thirdly, just to do your research and find some trustworthy agencies and trustworthy consultants to work with to help you through. That's been um, probably our number one piece of advice just to help us through the process. Joy, would you finish off this question for us? So I knew that I wanted to be involved in safe families like uh, quite a few years ago, um, but I didn't feel like I had the time or we were living with somebody and then the whole family was living with us for 15 months, so I was safe familying a family um, who are here. Shout out, Sweeney's. But... Um, I, so I knew I wanted to do this, but I just didn't, I don't know. I, I knew, I just put it, kept putting it on the back border. And the Langy Bartles graciously invited us to join their um, Safe Families group, all these wonderful people, and they meet quarterly. So probably for at least a year we met, and we were not involved. And they'd be like, what's everybody's update? I'm like, my update is there's no update. Um, and so, but through their graciousness and just prompting, like, hey, maybe you could just look at the application this month. (laughs) And so it took me a while, but just constantly being surrounded by people who also have this passion in this ministry um, like really encouraged me to finally take the step and to fill out the application and get started with it. So I would encourage you, even if you you are not sure you're there yet, to still reach out because they're not going to make you sign the dotted line next week or anything like that. But it was encouraging to be around other people who had that same heart for ministry. And it was also the prompting and pushing I needed to finally get things done to fill out the application and get started with it. So I would encourage you to do it. And also, you can also be a help to all of these people up here, even if you're not willing to host. 
people to make meals. That is so helpful. Um, even for me, my kiddo was at daycare, and it was so hard sometimes to drive him back and forth to daycare. So someone just to give him a ride was super helpful. Um, so even if you are not able to host yourself, you can still be a support system to the people up here. Yeah, that's great. So two things. God has called us into his family, like I referenced in First Peter. Um, we're chosen people so that we can proclaim his name. And this is just one way to have people from outside our homes come in, and then we can teach them about Jesus. And some of them send back out. Some of them stay with us until adulthood and then go off into their own lives, hopefully proclaiming that name themselves. The secondly is there's this theme throughout Scripture that we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to other people. So no matter what you're doing in your life, whether it's something like this, whether it's any of our other, I think, six missions partners, like what is God tugging you towards? Let's step into it. Uh, so if you are feeling any kind of tug on this, we would love to talk to you. There's a missions wall out here in the atrium. We'll be there after the service. Some of us, if any of you guys are free to, I know you, some of you have to go get kids and stuff, but come back there and we'd love to talk with you, get your name, at least give us a contact and we can connect with you. Write, write your email on the connect card, um, whatever. Get in touch with us. We'd love to talk with you about it and invite you to join us. Jana, would you pray? Jesus, I uh, just thank you for this wonderful picture of the gospel being lived out. Thank you for these families and the work you're doing, uh, the hearts that you're raising up to serve you in this way. I thank you for their bravery. Um, I pray if you are working in any hearts in this room right now, uh, a mission, a step, a calling that we are feeling that you would give us courage to take a step, even though we may not see how this may look or how this may play out, um, Jesus, that you would work in our hearts. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us and gives us strength and courage. I pray that you would go with us now for the rest of the morning. May our hearts be drawn to you in worship and obedience, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for Coming up here, we appreciate it. Would you all stand with us? We're going to get back into worship, singing about and to the name that we want to proclaim to the world around us. There is a name that reigns without contention, so power can't be questioned or contained with humble faith. He rules the earth and heavens His glory knows no measure or refrain And it's bursting past the borderlines of space Jesus Throned upon the praises of our You're the king and you're the center of it all. There is a name reached and past the margins. All the sons and daughters back to him. And as he says, you can hear the roar of heaven. The triumph of his name will never end. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our hearts. Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it You're the king and you're the center of your glory. For every hour we 
praise you for your name that is above every other name. The name that is worthy to be proclaimed because it brings life. The Old Testament prophesied about the life that you offered and you claim to be the Messiah. We want to fulfill that. We want to come to save. To give us hope for a future redemption from the past. The hope that we can anchor our souls in its secure and certain. We praise you for that. Father, as we open your word this morning, would you teach us, speak to our hearts. Cause us to follow you more closely, to serve you, to step into what you're doing in our lives, in our communities, and around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all please be seated. Good morning. Uh, before we get started, um, are Don and Ernie Hickman in here? Yeah, will you guys stand up? They're in the back. So we actually, the Hickman family had an unexpected loss this week. Dawn lost her father, uh, 74 years old. Um, it was just totally unanticipated. And so in moments like this, we want to gather around them as a family, as people who love them, as people who can encourage them and be present. Because grief is hard. And, and unexpected loss is hard. But the good news is that we have a God who sees you, he knows where you are, and he knows what grief and sorrow feel like. 
So we love you guys. We want to be here for you. The viewing is on Friday evening. The funeral is on Saturday. I believe an email went out yesterday with the details. Um, but if you would like more information, please get a hold of us. And uh, take a look at Don and Ernie. Give them a hug as you head out today. We want to surround them with love and encouragement. Thank you, guys. Thanks for standing up. All right. So I actually um, have known since August that I would be teaching this morning, and uh, it took me forever to land on a passage to preach. So what we've been doing is Eric has been covering the life of David, and then that anytime any of us who are on the teaching team get up, we will do a psalm. But nothing was coming to me, and it took me forever to find a passage to preach. At one point, I actually abandoned David and the Psalms altogether and thought we might need a little bit of the prophets and was going to go with Isaiah. But that didn't work out either. And then, so I was starting to get anxious with the Lord. And I just, like in nervous pleading, Lord, what are you saying? What do you want me to say to this? This is your church. These are your people. This message needs to come from you. And two weeks ago, it was during one of those moments of fear-induced pleading <laughs> that he responded with, there are some things that we need to talk about first. And I said, what? What? What things? I'm fine. I'm actually in a really good space right now, so I, think, like, I don't think there's anything to talk about. And he said, no, you're not. And I see what's going on. And I know what's going on. And we need to talk about it. So what is it? And I just thought, all right, if you want to do this right now. And I got out my journal. And I began to lay it out. You know, I'm, I'm angry with you and disappointed. I'm a little bit sad. And I'm frustrated because I hear you say things and I don't see them play out. I know that you're good. I don't see this goodness. The truth is, I trust you. I just don't understand what you're doing. And it actually ended up being a really effective time of journaling. A month ago, um, with Psalm 20, Ian asked the question, what do we do when we believe in God, but we don't trust him? And then a couple weeks ago, Eric followed up with, I don't know the how, but I know the who. As we looked at 2 Samuel 22. And I think that we might be on to something thematically. I think that the Lord might be trying to teach us something about himself in this space through the life and writing of David. And so we're going to continue in this vein, when, and we're going to ask the question, what do I do when I trust God, but I just don't understand what he's doing? So we're going to spend some time in Psalm 27 this morning, and in this psalm, David actually gives us a good perspective on what it's like to exist in the reality of what seemed to be opposing moods. So if you would go ahead and stand up, we're going to stand for the reading of the word this morning as we look at Psalm 27. And it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud and be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You can be seated. We see with this psalm what seem to be very distinct moods. We have confidence and anxiety trust and fear. And we may be tempted to ask the question, how? How can you be confident confident and anxious at the same time? How can trust and fear exist in the same mind? But guys, you're human. Like, this is the way we live, right? We are a jumble of conflicting emotions at all times. If any of you have taken the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course, um, you'll remember one of the exercises that they had us go through asked the following questions, and we had to write about it. What, so we had to write about, what are you anxious about? What are you angry about? What are you sad about? What is bringing you joy? And the interesting thing about that exercise is the realization that holy buckets, all of these things, are existing in me at the same time. This is what it is to be human. We have these conflicting emotions. And we see David here in Psalm 27 expressing his humanity. And he does it well. Because the first thing he does is draw upon the seat of his confidence and trust. In verse 1 he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So the first answer to the question that we're asking of what do I do when I trust God, but I just don't understand, is we recognize that our confidence is the Lord. Look at what he says here right from the beginning. He says, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. There is history here that David is drawing upon. This is actually the only time in the Old Testament where the Lord is actually called light. Light is often used to refer to his presence, but David isn't talking about his presence. He's talking about God himself. This idea is picked up again in the Gospels with John 1, when he talks about how the word became became flesh and dwelt among us. And he says, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. David is picking up on something about God here that would only later be fully illuminated for the rest of us. The Lord is light, light that illuminates the darkness, light that brings understanding, light that brings salvation, light that cannot be overcome. But pay attention because what we have here is military language. In the Hebrew, the word salvation is used for deliverance from enemies. A stronghold was a place of refuge. You would go there to regroup, to plan. You would go there for safety. You would go there to hold off an enemy. So even though we are seeing confident trust in David in verses 1 through 3, there's some kind of threat lurking in the background. And we learn more about this in verses 2 and 3. When evildoers assail me, When an army encamps against me, it's they who stumble and fall. I will not fear. I will still be confident. Something is happening in the background here, but David is building a case for his confidence. He has seen the Lord's proven faithfulness at various points of his life. Remember the story about Goliath, who was literally a giant. When David went out to face him, Goliath was the one who said, come out here and I will give your your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. But it wasn't David who fell that day. It was Goliath. It was Goliath who stumbled and fell and then got his head cut off. Veggie Tales generally leaves that part out. (laughs) An army encampment is thousands of soldiers. It's tents everywhere. It's the sound of horses. It's seeing your army spread out before you as far as the eye can see, and yet... David is confident. He has seen his enemies fall around him. He has seen the Lord show up repeatedly to not just deliver him, but to deliver the people as well. He can say that the Lord is his light, his salvation, and his refuge because he knows it's true. He's experienced it. Our trust in God comes from our confidence in him. And we can say that we are confident in him because we know him. We draw our experience from him. 
we build a case for our own confidence because we are going back to the well of our lives and drawing up those experiences where he has been faithful, where he has been good, where he has shown up, where he has been our light and our safety and our refuge, the places in our life that lead us to the place where we can say, Lord, I trust you. Now, for me, this mostly looks like journaling. If I feel like the Lord is saying something to me, or if I'm working through a particular situation, I write it down. I write down my prayers. I write down the things I'm going through. I write down the ways in which he speaks or shows up or reveals something about himself. And then I have that to go back and refer to. But I also know dates. I can go back to May of 2001 and know that the Lord met me in a powerful way. I can go back to January of 2016. I can go back to December of 2017. I can go back to April of 2019 and August of 2019 because these dates matter to me because the Lord has shown up in powerful ways and I have to log that in my well of life so I can come back to it and draw it up when I need it. But what might this look like for you? We, can't build, we can help each other build up confidence in the Lord. But you have to start paying attention to the ways that he shows up in your life. So for students, this might look like Ignite. Ignite might be the place that you go back to and draw from. And some of you, it might be the one-day wall, writing down your prayer, presenting it to the Lord, flipping that card over, believing that he's going to show up. Or how about the prayer room? How many of you guys have gone up to the prayer room year in and year out and written down your prayers and presented them to the Lord or written on the walls? Whatever it is, whatever works for you, start keeping track. Mark the times in your life when you know without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord has shown up and has been light for you or a refuge or salvation in times of trouble, because there will be a time when you have to go back and draw on those experiences. And that's what David is doing here. But in verse 4, we see what seems to be an ab abrupt shift. David has been talking about his confidence in who the Lord is, but now he starts to talk about what he needs from the Lord. And he says, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. It may seem like a quick change of ideas going from building confidence to presenting a request. But really what we find here is the second answer to the question, what do I do when I trust God but? And David shows us the example. We go to where the Lord is. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was found in the temple. Now, it wasn't confined to the temple. God is not confined to anything. But with their system of worship, it was the temple that the, the presence of the Lord dwelt. And it was sacred, and it was holy, and the people loved it and would go there. So when David refers to the house of the Lord, he's talking about a specific location where he can go to be with God. Now, there is some debate about at what point David is in his life when he writes this psalm. But chances are he's nowhere near the temple. So chances are he's on the run or he's hiding or he's fleeing enemies because what we have learned from the life of David over the past several months is that that is a constant reality. I don't think that dude ever got to settle down. He was always fleeing from someone. There are enemies present at this moment in this psalm and even in the midst of this trouble, David's desire is to be in the presence of God. The presence of enemies for David is not just a physical one. It's a spiritual one. The presence of enemies is a problem that can deplete the ability of the soul to endure. And we're going to come back to that idea in a minute. But here, in the midst of trouble, it's the Lord that David wants to see. The presence of God is, is that joining of what is tangible and what is not tangible. It's what we believe and know to be true versus what we cannot see or feel or grasp a hold of. And it's this space, it's this presence of the Lord where, where the soul can be fortified. 
where transformation can happen. And we learn in verses 5 and 6 that David is yearning for the safety that comes from and can be felt by the presence of God. He says, for he will hide me in the day of trouble. He will conceal me. He will lift me up above my enemies. He knows the Lord is his rescue. What David is saying here is, I just want to be where you are. I want to be near you. I want to see you. I want to experience your presence. There's nothing else that I want. There's nothing else that I need. Because David understands that the Lord's presence is where transformation happens. A little while ago, I was angry with the Lord because why does everything in life have to be some kind of lesson? I'm not alone, right? Obviously, I'm not alone if you guys are responding to that. Um, and at this particular point, I remember saying, I just don't understand what the lesson is here. And he very clearly came back with, it's me. I'm the lesson. Do you ever have moments that you hear from the Lord and it just shuts you up completely? <laughs> you have nothing, nothing left to say, no other complaints to be made. How often is he the lesson and we just totally miss it? Instead of seeking after him, we get angry, we get confused, and instead of pressing in, instead of going to where he is, we just leave it. We pretend it isn't there. I am really good at ignoring the Lord, like really good. And it hovers, it gets to the point where it just kind of hovers in the background, where I see it, I kind of know it, I know it needs to be acknowledged, and I just refuse to do so. Until it gets to the point where everything is spilling out everywhere and it's kind of crisis mode. But what do we miss if we refuse to seek after the Lord? By refusing to go where he is. By ignoring him and continuing on like everything is fine. What things could he be trying to teach us in that space about himself if we just saw him first? What would happen if we let him in to that space of anger or confusion or trouble? And this is something that David seems to have always understood about the Lord. And I think that's why we have so much about his life and so much writing from him. Whatever life threw his way, good times, bad times, confusing times, his method was to seek the Lord. Now, remember a few minutes ago, we started talking about this idea of the endurance of the soul and how enemies can pose a threat to that ability. Now, we very rarely have physical enemies now. What person is actually your enemy? They can make you mad. They're not really your enemy. More often than not, our enemies are enemies of the soul. When I spoke back in August, we talked about how the soul is yourself. You, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. So your enemy, more often than not, is going to feel like an enemy of the soul. And that's personal. It's more isolating. And it can look a whole lot different for each of us. It can look like fear or anger or sadness or loneliness or confusion or fill in the blank and these enemies pose a spiritual problem that can deplete our soul of its ability to endure, to carry on. They can chip away at our internal well-being, and they can feel us like we have been eroded and totally depleted, as though we're, we're actually losing ourself. We have nothing left. And what David understands is that there is only one person who can provide rescue from this problem, and that's the Lord. He can build up what has been eroded. He has the supplies to be able to do so. A strong face and self-determination is only going to get you so far, but it's the Lord who can bring restoration. Life comes from the Lord. Identity comes from the Lord. So what do we do when we trust God, but there are enemies surrounding us and we don't know what to do? We go to where he is. We go to where he is. 
We seek out his presence. He is the one who can rescue and restore, who can lift up our heads from the enemies that surround us, who can bring transformation. So what does that look like? And it, does, it doesn't have to be complicated. I think that's the beautiful thing about it. Seek out quiet space. Write down your prayers. Write down your requests. Make them known. Listen. Don't just barge in, demand things, and then walk out like he doesn't have anything to say. James 4.8 tells us, draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. We don't have to overcomplicate it. We don't have to go to a specific location to be where the Lord is. He's everywhere. But we do have to carve out time to, go to, to, to be with him. We have to carve out space in our life for that. And this leads us to David's prayer that begins uh, in verse 7 and continues through verse 12. So he's built a case for his confidence, but there are enemies present. And so now he begins to plead with the Lord. And this is a summary of what he says. He says, hear me. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. I am. I want to. Do not hide from me. Do not turn me away in anger. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. Even when the last of those on my side forsake me, take me in. Teach me your way. Lead me on a level path. Do not give me up to my adversaries. Earlier this summer, I went on vacation um, with my family to Colorado. And there are 11 of us when we're all, t my immediate family, when we're all together, age aging from six to 60. And we were all in the same cabin, so it was a little chaotic, but also very wonderful. And my niece Evangeline is nine, and we are basically best friends. So she wanted to stay with me while we were there, even though she had to sleep on the floor and even though our bedtimes were several hours apart, she just wanted to be where I was. And so on the final evening, um, she and I stayed up reading in the room. And the book she was reading started to scare her a little bit. And she knew I had read it before, so she started to ask me questions about her book. And then she would ask me questions about my book. And then she would go back to questions about her book. And then she would ask me questions not related to either book at all. It probably went on like this for an hour. I don't think I got one page read. But I also didn't care. At one point, she said, Aunt Julia, am I annoying you? And I said, no way, babe, keep talking. I loved that moment with her. I loved that she wanted to sleep in my room even though it was on the floor. I love that she just wanted to be with me and talk to me and ask me questions. I love her. She's a delight to me. And I think that this is just a glimpse of how the Lord views us. He loves us. We are not a burden to him. We're a delight. And we need to know this. We need to hold it as truth. Somehow we've bought into this idea that God is distant or remote, that he is too busy. Because I got to tell you, if God is too busy for us, then he's not God, and we've got bigger issues on our hands. He loves us. We're a delight to him. Do you believe this? That God loves you. His love does not run out. His kindness goes on forever. His compassion for you and his graciousness have no limit. They're lasting that is his disposition. But like David here, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. We know it's true, theoretically, but it doesn't feel like it's true because sometimes it does feel like he's not listening or he is far off or he is ignoring us or he's just fed up. The good news is that God's love for us is not based on how we feel. His, his reaction to you is not based on your mood, anything that you've done, any reaction that you have had towards him. His love for you is constant. Look back at what David says here. He says, hear me. Do not hide from me. Do not turn away. Do not forsake me. Teach me your ways. Lead me on your path. Do not give me up to my enemies. Now, does David really believe that the Lord will ignore him 
or actually hide. Or that this will be the moment when all the promises that God has made toward him will fail and everything will be over. No, no, he doesn't believe that. But it's that juxtaposition of confidence and anxiety. David has total confidence in who God is. He's seen it before. He wants to see it again. But there's still the turmoil of present anxiety. But pay attention here. Because instead of shoving it down and pretending like it's not there and moving forward like everything is fine, he makes his anxiety known. He presents his requests to the Lord. It's the opposite of of refusing to press in. It's also the third answer to the question, what do I do when I trust God? But we bring our requests to the Lord. We go to where he is. We make our anxieties, fears, worries, anger, turmoil, whatever it is, we make it known. David trusts God. And because he trusts God, he's not afraid to bring him his reality. He knows deep down that the Lord is not going to ignore him or turn away or hide or give him up. But the anxiety is a present reality. And David presents it in full. With my niece, she started asking me questions because she was afraid. And I could have responded with, Evie, stop talking. Just read your book. You'll find out things as you go. Just keep reading. But why would I do that to her when I love her and I want to hear from her? When she just wants to be where I am and she trusts me enough to ask questions. Two weeks ago when I was hesitant to bring up all that I was feeling with the Lord, he could have just left it. Not brought it up at all. You don't want to share? Fine. Doesn't matter to me. And then we continue on with our lives like petulant children, passive-aggressively ignoring one another. But that's not the Lord. (laughs) He does not behave this way. He presses in. He cares. He said, we have things we need to talk about. So let's do that first. David knows enough about God to know that he's not going to be abandoned. His confidence from the first few verses is seated in present experience. But he wants to be heard by the Lord and accepted. He wants guidance and protection, and he knows where to go for these things. And he's unafraid to enter into that space because he knows that the Lord will meet him there and not reject him. That is confidence in the midst of anxiety. He goes to his source And he trusts that the Lord is there, even if it doesn't feel like it. Which leads us to the final commission given in verses 13 and 14. Worship team, you guys can come back up. Verses 13 and 14 say, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. What do we do when we trust God, but we wait? We wait. We remain strong and we take courage because we know that we will see the goodness of the Lord. As I was forming this sermon, I asked the Lord, what is it you're wanting to say? And he responded with, what is it that I am saying to you in all of this, in all that you've presented, in all that you are going through, what do you feel like I'm saying? And that's what led me to Psalm 27. Because what I felt like the Lord was saying to me was, wait, wait. The story isn't over. I'm not finished working. And I know that you don't understand. I know that you're frustrated. I know that you're sad or confused. But I'm not done working. Just wait. Just wait. Regardless of how David was feeling or how I am feeling or how you may be feeling about who the Lord is and what he may be up to, the truth is he's not finished working. As long as there is breath in your body, he will not be finished working. And we're going to take a few minutes to sit 
in that space. Because we've there's a lot to take in here. And this is our opportunity to be where the Lord is and present our realities to him. On your note sheet, uh, you'll see several questions listed at the bottom. This isn't a test. This isn't a workshop. You don't have to share this with anyone. But I want us to have a moment where we can be honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord. And you can write things down. You can close your eyes. You can take a couple minutes to just be. But we're going to go through the, the questions together. So if you take out your notes, look at the first question, and it says, we're going back to that emotionally healthy spirituality exercise. And it's answering the question or thinking about the question, what am I angry about? What am I sad about right now? What is making me anxious right now? What are the things that are bringing me joy? And it's okay to acknowledge that all of these things are there below the surface. That you don't have to have a strong face. It's below the strong face. So take a few moments to think about these things. Write them down if you need to. Or mark them and come back to them. But let's take a few moments for that. With the next question, I want to think about the seat of our confidence. So we're asking the question, is the Lord my confidence or am I drawing from something else? What may need to change within me? So think about the moments in your life where he has been faithful, where he has been good. Make a note, write them down. If you haven't, start writing them down now. Pay attention moving forward. But look back on those moments where he has shown up and has been faithful, where he has been your confidence. third question is, do I believe that the Lord truly loves me and is present in my life? Can I believe this? On your note sheet, you'll see several scripture references. Check these out at some point. If you need to know how God feels about you, start there. Store these up because he loves you. Do you believe that? Final question, what does waiting look like for me? Because I'll tell you, waiting is not in action. It's pressing in, it's listening, it's continuing to live life, believing that you will see the goodness of the Lord. So take a moment to think about what does waiting look like for me?
I know we haven't had a lot of time to go through these questions, but I want you to take it, this note sheet with you. If you need one, grab one on your way out. But this is stuff that you can, you can think about as you go through the week. Where do I need to remember that the Lord is my confidence? Where do I need to remember where he's been good? What do I need to change within me or present to him? What should waiting look like for me? If you want to go ahead and stand, we're going to move into our final worship song. Ushers can go ahead and come forward. We'll receive the offering at this time too. Um, If you are visiting with Eagle, you are under no obligation to give. But we believe in living generous lives. And part of that is the finances. So as we enter into this last song, let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you that you love us, that you're present even when it doesn't feel like it. Thank you that you know us, that you are not too busy. Help us to live our lives with you and not separate from you. Help us to be confident in who you are, to trust you with every situation, to come to you with our present realities, to present things to you in full, and to wait patiently for you. Holy Spirit, give us courage to do so. Thank you for the work that you have started in our lives, and thank you that you are the one who will complete it. We thank you for the stories that will come from the moments that we have with you, from the work that you do in our lives, the stories that are already coming. Thank you for the ways that you show up and you are good. And we love you. Amen.
in those extra minutes this morning. Um, Justin said earlier that our pillars, the things that we put our time and attention to here, um, missions, next gen, and discipleship. And we saw a little bit about uh, domestic missions this morning with Safe Families, but Justin and Ryan are leaving for Bosnia on Thursday. So we want to give them a chance to share about the things that they'll be doing in Bosnia. Yeah, so we partner with Petula Myers, who is our first-time, full-time missionary that Eagle had the privilege of sending out back in 03, and she's in Bosnia. And so we have the privilege of going. Ryan's actually been before. This will be my first time, um, but we get to go and do some ministry there. We're going to be leading worship and playing some cover music for, a I don't even know what, a coffee house or something. <laughs> um, I'll be preaching some. We'll be leading a worship workshop. Be doing some prayer walking throughout the country. We're actually going to go to several sites. So Petula's in Sarajevo, and she works out of a center there called they call the Source. And um, we'll be there part of the time. We'll be traveling some other areas. They've got the country divided up into quadrants, and we're just going to be praying um, mm-hmm. and kind of walking and seeing some different places and kind of new ministry that they're up to. And so, uh, yeah, we're really excited about it. Do you want to say anything? You know, my my prayer request for you guys would just be that over these next couple of weeks, um, I just want to I, I want to spend some time really creating a vision for like how we can how we can bring the need in that area of the world back here. Um, you know, to Western Hemisphere people like us, it's not a super attractive place to go, and um, I'm just looking forward to to seeing what God puts on us as far as a message and. The worship stuff will be fun, too, getting to teach some classes. And... Cool. Yeah, and I'll just say one thing about it. Yeah. Um, when we talk about missions here, we, God's called us to all people everywhere in the most unreached places of the world. And Bosnia is incredibly unreached, like 1%, less than 1% of active followers of Jesus in that space. So a country of, of almost 5 million people and fewer believers than attend this church in the whole country. And so that's why we're there, because 
uh, it doesn't look all that humanitarian. You know, we like to we like to do things that look like we're really helping people. And and the reality is, is a spiritual brokenness. There is a there's a spiritual stronghold in that country. And so, with Ryan, I'd like for you, I'd just ask you guys to be praying for us. Pray the the Holy Spirit would show up and would bring some breakthrough in that country. Pray for that nation, for Petula, for the workers there. Uh, for us as we're there, and like Ryan said, that we can come back with fresh vision about what it looks like for us to step into that space with the gospel. Ian is going to pray for you guys this oh, morning. Hey buddy. <laughs> <laughs> if you could stretch out your hands, we're going to, I mean, they're going out from all of us. This is a representation of Eagle Church, and that's all of us. God, you've made it clear in your word that we are to be the sent. We are called by you. That as we are going, we get to disciple, we get to be a part of your kingdom purposes in this world. And Lord, I pray specifically for these two men now in this space, that they would be so empowered by your spirit for the tasks that they will be going about. Lord, we ask that there would be a supernatural anointing upon them, and upon the entire team, on Petula, on those that they'll be interacting with. Lord, we pray for breakthrough in a place where we know that there are believers who have been working tirelessly and might feel like they aren't seeing a ton of fruit. But, Lord, we know that you are the God of the harvest. Mm -hmm. Lord, that you would um, do a work through these guys that would be beyond what they could ask or imagine. So, Lord, we ask now, boldly in the name of Christ, that they would be able to be a part, that they would join into the work that you've already been doing. I pray, Lord, also that you would use these guys to encourage the hearts of those who have been faithful. Lord, that they would feel so loved on and that they would feel so comforted. Lord, we see that all over the epistles, how much Paul points to encouragement and support and being sharpened by one another. Lord, we pray that there would be those who at this point do not know you, but through the ministry that you, you will do through these guys and through those who have been on the ground, that they would come to that saving faith, that they would see you as Lord and Savior. So we ask that your hand would be upon them. And Lord, show us as a church what it is to prayerfully support, what it is to share in the burden, what it is to support families when husbands and fathers are gone. Lord, we pray that this would truly be that picture of your bride, the church, as we send these guys out. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. All right, just a few announcements, and then we'll get out of here. It always happens on Sundays that Eric isn't here. So a couple announcements. We have a connection lunch coming up on Sunday, November 24th. It'll be directly after the service, 1130 to 1-ish, down in the multipurpose room on the lower level. If you are new to Eagle, if you want to find out more information, if you want to spend some time with the pastors and a couple of the elders, sign up for this lunch. You can go to eaglechurch.com backslash events and you can sign up there. We also have our Eagle Men and Eagle Women discipleship courses coming up in December. That will be the 4th, the 11th, and the 18th. Those registrations are also live. So go ahead and get signed up for that because last round was really good and I think this round is going to be really good too. And then finally, we are having a baby dedication on Sunday, November 17th. So if you have um, a newborn or a child that you would like to have dedicated, um, you can talk to Kim Shepson, who is the kids director downstairs, or you can go to eaglechurch.com backslash events and find out more uh, information that way. And with that, you can go ahead and stand up. And our benediction this week comes from Psalm 37. And it's along the same lines of the things that we've been talking about. Um, beginning in verse 3, David says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. So may the God who is always present in your life Show up in new and surprising ways. And along the way, may he remind you that he loves you, that you are not alone, and that he has good things in store for you. Wait patiently and wait with courage. We love you. Have a good day.